So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jillian from the City of Superior, and welcome to our webinar. Um, this webinar is part of the Businesses Preventing Pollution webinar series. Um, we've done a bunch of different topics uh, for the webinars. We started in, I think, July, June or July, and we've been covering different types of things like um, programs around the Twin Ports for businesses to become more sustainable, things like the Count Me Green program, or in Wisconsin, the Green Tier program, sustainable Twin Ports early adopters. But we've also covered things um, more specific to different industries, like uh, dental mercury management, waste management for the auto industry, things like that. So Susie's going to be talking today about composting food waste. So our speaker today is Susan Darley-Hill from the Western Lake Superior Sanitary District, and she is an environmental program coordinator over there. So I'm actually going to transfer um, controls over to her right now. And then she will talk to us about the composting food waste. Okay, thanks Jillian. Susie here. Um, thanks for those of you who are joining us, or if you hear this at a later date. Um, yeah, we have a great organics program going over here um, in Duluth, um, actually in the Western Lake Superior Sanitary District, and that's something that I want to um, just kind of explain. People don't always understand if, you're, if your services are provided by the city or by the county, then what the heck is a sanitary district? So we were created by the state legislature um, back in the early 70s, um, specifically to address um, uh, wastewater issues in the Lower St. Louis River Basin. Um, so we are a governmental entity. We do have a citizen board that um, governs us, a board of directors. Uh, we have an executive director. Um, and our service area is about 530 square miles. Um, so um, Susie? The wastewater Authority. Yeah. Uh, we can't see your slides. I don't know if you have them up or not. I just, I wasn't sure. So, we're, For some reason, I'm not able all. to see them. So, okay, sorry. All right, let's see. Oh, there we go. How about now? <laughs> yep, that's all perfect. All right, let me just back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yeah, well, I already said all those words that you can see there anyhow. So, um, yep, just uh, we were both, uh, are both the Wastewater Authority and the Solid Waste Authority, um, which was... Um, responsibility that was awarded to us a little bit later, but um, that actually figures prominently into what I'll be talking about today. So here's our service area. It's about 530 square miles, as I said, and it encompasses the city of Duluth, um, Hermantown, Proctor, Cloquet, um, even into the northern part of Carlson County there, and just up the shore a little bit. Um, we operate also then these solid waste programs, um, and um, those of you that are, live in Superior know that you can utilize our household hazardous waste facility. We have a clean shop program that uh, we operate for businesses, and this is just to handle those things. We have, this is a permanent facility, and we actually go out and do mobile collections as well in communities that don't have um, this capacity. We have a materials recovery center, which is up near the airport, um, and that's for some larger items, um, bulky items. Uh, mattresses and um, dimensional lumber and television sets and all those those goodies. And then down here at the 27th Avenue West facility, um, which is just across the bay from Superior, we operate our yard waste and organics composting facility. We also um, have a, a lively recycling program, and we you know, certainly have curbside collection here, um, requirements for commercial businesses to recycle, and we also operate uh, or at least um, fund township rural township sheds and folks. So it's the stuff in red we're talking about today. Um, but just so you all know what a transfer station is, um, we don't have uh, uh, landfill on this side of the, um, of the river for our solid waste that comes from, from uh, the communities. And so what we do here is uh, operate a transfer station. We look at all the garbage that's collected in the area, weigh it out, um, looking for things that uh, our problem materials because we will actually repackage the material then and send it over to um, the Mock of the Mike landfill. Um, so our garbage currently from this um, sanitary district does go to Mock of the Mike. Um, so um, we 
have been composting for quite a while over here. Um, started in the 90s, but um, we have really expanded that program here. And the view that you're getting is actually sort of looking towards Superior as an aerial view of our composting facility. Um, we did away storage back in the um, in 1999 and um, found that we about 14 percent of the material in there was organics. We have since done another waste characterization sort, which actually, surprisingly, we had a higher level of organics in there considering that we have this organics program in place. <laughs> but I think that just um, speaks to the amount of stuff that people actually are discarding from their refrigerators and, and whatnot. Um, the site, um, we received funding to construct a really nice site. Uh, we actually have since made improvements on that as well. But the state of Minnesota funds helped us do that. We acquired equipment um, that allowed us to um, you know, mix and, and turn and move the material around. And um, so it was, it was a pretty significant investment. Um, and we started um, uh, bringing in food waste then. Uh, in 2002. So previously we've just been composting yard waste and um, we received a permit to operate this kind of facility and we can take in almost 4,000 tons of yard waste and equivalent amount of food waste every year. And from that material in about a four to six month process, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, um, we make about 2,500 yards of, of compost. It's called garden green compost every year. And we do participate in the United States Composting Council program of uh, the Standards of Testing Assurance program. So it's just not a willy-nilly mixture of stuff that we make, but it's a really highly controlled process. And at the end of that process, the material is um, sent out for testing at an independent lab and that get quite a battery of tests done so that the folks that buy the compost, and we do sell it in bags and in bulk, um, know exactly what they're getting in that particular batch of compost. Okay, so we've been doing um, the food waste program for about 12 years. Um, we started out on a voluntary basis. Uh, we had um, a, close to 50 at the top of the, of the program when we were doing it voluntarily of uh, regular commercial participants. There was only one hauler, and it, we have a private hauling system on this side of the river, so um, one hauler agreed to do this, um, and then we actually hired a contractor to help us acquire the food waste. So go out and talk to restaurants, to hospitals, to all the places that were generating a lot of this food waste and, and uh, see if we couldn't get them to participate in the program. Um, we also ran a curbside pilot uh, for residents in a particular part of town, the far east side of town, in 2003 because there was this question out there. We knew that we had a lot of food coming out of, of things like nursing homes and and colleges and whatnot, but what does that residential side look like as well? And so we were able to characterize um, what that did look like, and we're considering you know, the possibility of maybe having curbside collection, but couldn't really get <laughs> the haulers on board with that. Um, but it did um, allow us to have a better understanding of what's going on in homes around the area. Um, then we started down the road of the stakeholder meetings where we brought in the haulers and we brought in these major food waste generators to talk to them, to find out, you know, how can we get more of you to participate? Um, what would it take to get all of you on board to divert your food waste from the landfill and um, allow us to do something better with that? Um, and as a result of that, um, we did um, come up with a plan where we actually, we heard from them. They said, unless you make us do it, we're not going to do it. And so we did start going down that road for the, towards the ordinance um, that we have in place now. Um, at that same time, uh, when we completed the curbside pilot, the residential curbside pilot, we um, did establish uh, food waste drop sites around town when we couldn't get the haulers to agree to, to implement this kind of collection. And really what it is is the density. You need to have a certain amount of customers that are doing that, that want to do that in an area in order for it to really be worth your while. There's a you know truck, you have to devote a truck, it takes a lot of gas, and if you're driving to one house on every other street, um, it's really not worth your while. So we thought, well, we'll bring the drop sites to the residents and um, I'll explain a little bit more about that program uh, in a minute. So um, we um, 
got a grant from the state of Minnesota that allowed us to purchase compostable bags, and these were a smaller size bag that we could provide to folks. Um, and we did um, establish these food waste drop sites uh, incrementally. Um, and the way the town looks, actually, here we go, let's pop over here. Duluth is really long. Um, it's really almost, almost about 40 miles long and only five miles wide. And so we needed to um, get these sites established in places where we could reach as many people as possible. I'm going to go backwards now. Um, uh, so we started out um, with two of these sites located at our facilities, one down here at the Yardway site and one up at the Materials Recovery Center. And then we also um, uh, invited um, Marshall Hardware out in the far east side of Duluth, which is where we had run our pilot, to participate as a small business, or I'm sorry, as a, as a drop site. So this would be a business hosting a drop site for residential food waste, which is kind of unusual. But they were fabulous partners in the program, uh, the curbside pilot, by supplying bags to folks and, and information. And um, they have served as a drop site for us since this time. And it's really one of the most popular drop sites we have. They get close to 1,000 pounds a week of, of food waste just brought in by residents. Um, we also established a business-only drop site, and this would be for small businesses when we get to talking about the ordinance, so we'll address that a little bit more because not everybody falls under that. Currently, we have six drop sites um, in operation, and um, let's see. All right, we, were, we rolled this out incrementally because we really didn't know what it was going to look like. What's it like to set up a dumpster where people can drop off their food waste, and what kind of problems are we going to run into? Are we going to have bears getting in there? How often do we have to collect it? Um, you know, are we going to get people like setting garbage outside there or trying to get inside to put regular garbage in there? And happily, we really haven't run into most of those things, but you know, the rollout was slow. We started with three, and now we're at six. And uh, I think that's worked very well for us. Let's see. So, um, you know, back to the map here. Um, you can see we've got the far east side of town. Here's Marshall Hardware. Way on the west side of town, we have Munger Inn. Um, up at the Materials Recovery Center is where we have a drop set that can serve um, that part of the population that's up there. We actually have one uh, kind of in the heart of the University District here at Chester Creek Cafe. Um, and then our yard waste site, and then our actually our business food waste drop site now. It used to be at Duluth Grill. It's moved over here to our household hazardous waste facility, and that's accessible 24 hours a day. When Duluth Grill um, instituted their big gardening program over there, we decided we should probably, they were kind enough to host it, but we would move it over here to give them a little more space so they could put their orchard in and whatnot. Um, the coffee den also served as the drop site. That um, place has since closed, um, so we don't have a drop set up in Proctor right now. All right, so on to the businesses. Um, we know that there's a lot of residential food waste out there still, but we also knew um, in order really to capture the, the bulk of what's out there, the stuff that's being you know scraped off of plates, the stuff that's um, being thrown in the garbage from, from food, food prep and hospitals and restaurants and whatnot, how do we get that? And so um, we did determined that in order to make this happen, it was going to have to become uh, mandatory. Um, and the intent really is just to get participation to really remove this material from um, uh, you know, the waste stream and to do something good with it. And not everything is the stuff that has to be turned into compost. There was a lot of edible food that um, could be captured and, and reused for a higher purpose. And so, you know, it supports all of these these good things. So, our recovery replaces disposal, and um, you can make something good out of something that's generated locally, and, and do it right here in our own in our own backyard, I guess. Um, so, looking at what is organic waste, and um, with our our ordinance, we just targeted the pre-consumer organic waste, which is everything that you generate when you are making food, and um, so it and you know, with, when you're talking about composting, people shy away from the animal waste, but the way we compost here, we do it in a very big way, and um, we don't um, generate the kinds of odors or have the kinds of problems that you can if you're trying to do this really small scale in your backyard. So we definitely take all animal products, uh, vegetable waste, and whatnot. Um, if you have outdated stuff that never goes onto someone's plate um, or is sold uh, at your grocery store, that 
is considered pre-consumer organic waste. Post-consumer is the stuff that comes off of plates. We do not cover that under our ordinance, but we find that most of our participants are actually um, recovering that material as well. Then we have the industrial organic waste, and this would be things um, that you would get from you know, fish hatchery, uh, from waste grain that falls on the ground at our elevators, and we do get a significant amount of that um, annually. And here's what it looks like. Pre-consumer, when you're trimming off the ends of your lettuce, you've got your little onion peels, potato peels, all those kinds of things, bones that are trimmed away, fat that's trimmed away, and then the post-consumer is the plate scraping. And as I said, this pre-consumer is the only um, material that's required under the ordinance to be diverted for beneficial reuse, but we do see the vast majority of our folks actually um, capturing the post-consumer as well. In our ordinance, which is, was just revised again, these are the folks that are required to um, do something better with their uh, pre-consumer food waste than to throw it in the garbage. So grocery stores, um, and we've expanded to include things like a, a Target that would have a grocery area, um, restaurants and caterers, um, colleges. We don't include elementary or high schools in this. Um, but the colleges that are feeding lots of residents um, you know, on site would fall into this. Hospitals, nursing homes, food manufacturers, like an Upper Lakes Food, um, and then assisted living facilities and correctional facilities. And, and folks do have the option. They do fall into the ordinance, but if they um, prepare their food in such a way that they really are not generating much pre-consumer food waste, they can certainly petition for exemption. And we found this with some of our assisted living facilities. They're real, actually quite small. And um, so those have certainly um, been granted exemptions. So the hierarchy that the state of Minnesota has in place uh, for preferred um, beneficial reuse is as follows. And people are at the top of the heap. If you have edible food that you've generated in your facility, and it is still good and can be safely transported to, for example, a feeding program like um, CHOM or um, Union Gospel Mission or Salvation Army, something like that, that is far preferred than you know, sending it for composting. And we do have a really um, a strong program here with Second Harvest, which does a great job. They've got refrigerator trucks, and they come and pick that material up and, and get it to the folks that, that need it. And so that definitely is at the top of the heap, much better than throwing it away and, and even better than composting. Um, we have no licensed animal feeding operations here. Um, that is something that's required when there is a risk of um, with the pigs. Um, in particular, the Department of Animal Health has some pretty stringent rules about the material having to be cooked before it's fed to the animals. And so we don't really have anything like that around here. Um, but if we did, like they do down a little bit further south, um, that's a great option as well. And then last of all, at the bottom, um, is the composting. And so that is also a really good alternative. Um, and we call this the hierarchy, the people, pigs, and pansies hierarchy. So first to people, if it's, if it's edible and safe, second to pigs or an animal feeding operation, and then lastly then to compost, which will then be used to hopefully grow more food. Um, we, the program is pretty successful, I think, um, and it's because we brought stakeholders on very early, um, and we all have our, our own responsibilities to make this work. Um, and so we have staff that goes out, we have materials, uh, literature, we work with staff, we'll do training to um, help, for example, um, serve staff or back of the house staff like the dishwashers um, understand what's happening with this stuff and why it's important that we keep the plastic and the glass and the straws out and, and uh, we don't want that in our compost. Um, and then the businesses themselves so do pay for the service to have their food waste hauled. Um, and we work with them to make sure that they are um, really doing all that they can because in the long haul, if you really generate a lot of this material, it's beneficial to divert it because you avoid um, taxes and disposal fees. We have a zero tip fee here for um, source-separated organics that come in. And yeah, it really behooves folks if they are generating a lot to, to do that instead. It's a lot of avoided expense. The haulers are the ones that are responsible for picking that up, um, and they develop their own collection schedules and work with their customers. Um, they provide the containers. They have to be labeled a certain way. And then everyone has to document what they're doing. And we then go out periodically and do um, compliance checks just to make sure that 
people have questions or make sure things are going the right way, um, and that just kind of keeps, keeps the program going. We have about 200 businesses that fall under the ordinance. Not all of them are having to participate. Um, and we are seeing certainly an increase in what's coming in here. We're kind of bumping up against what our limit is now. Um, and so we're hoping, because we've changed the way that we are composting um, a little bit, the way we move things around here on our site, to actually um, have that up just a little bit so we can um, make sure that we are able to handle everything that is being generated here. And this is what it looks like. Um, we've got a nursing home over here, a kitchen in the nursing home. You can see we've got a compostable bag inside uh, one of these little green rolling bins. And this is food prep waste, which is just being put in there. So you would always want to have containers in your prep area. Um, and then in your dishwashing area, um, you would also have a place to capture the stuff off the plate. And again, this is not required. But especially in a place like a hospital and nursing home, this is where vast majority of your of your food waste is going to be coming from. Um, University of Minnesota has been a partner for a really long time since the inception of the food waste recovery program and they actually use big pulpers and everything that comes off the plates goes through the pulper and so it's it's kind of pre-mixed before we even see it. And again this is a special compostable bag that lines the material and it just keeps things um, nice and tidy. Um, the, the Duluth, uh, the DAC, Duluth Entertainment and Convention Center, has also been a partner for a long time. They really um, have brought this program to kind of the, the pinnacle. They are so good. Their staff is so engaged. Um, and really, everything that goes on there, they recycle to the max, and they really recapture um, the food waste, uh, both in the prep and the post-consumer um, aspects. And they have a lot of buy-in, as I said, from the employees. They listen to their employees. They take their suggestions seriously. And I think that's one reason it's been such a super successful program. Um, and again, all the major restaurants are participating in this and have been um, kind of since early days, uh, back in 2007. And again, we have uh, back of the house, the prep area, um, both of those areas where we're seeing. And they even have done some. Uh, making of their own equipment to uh, allow the, for example, the servers that come in and have to um, clean the plates quickly can just knock a tray or knock a plate very quickly and, and get the food off of it. And everybody does it a little bit differently. Some people use rolling carts. Um, some people use bags. Some people don't. And so if you don't use bags, this is kind of what your food waste looks like, the picture on the right. Um, this particular facility, which um, serves a lot of people, has an internal area where it stores its, its uh, food waste. Um, this is a chain restaurant up in, in the Miller Hill area. And again, a lot of different ways of doing things. They're using this rolling bin here, a different size bag. And then their food waste is not in a big dumpster, but is in, in rolling carts here. Our drop site program um, looks like this. You saw the map where the we've got these drop sites located all around town. And in some places where we get a little bit less um, coming in, we just use carts like this. And other places that are really heavily used up at service table, this is an example of what we've got there, um, significant amount of food waste being captured. OK, now to the composting end of things. Um, this is an overview, um, superior would be to your back if you're looking at this, of our composting site. And the food waste, we'll just kind of walk you through the process. And this is going to be um, a counterclockwise uh, movement here. Food waste comes into the pad right here. It's brought in by garbage trucks. They're weighed when they come in. And um, they tip their load uh, right here. And um, that information from the scale, the tip scale, um, is put into a computer so we know exactly how much of the leaves and the wood grindings we're going to have to mix that day. We use a big mixer. It straddles the, the pile of food waste and, and brush and, and leaves that we've stretched out along the, the pad here. And these knives in here chop it up. And uh, we then load it into long windrows. These windrows sit on top of uh, perforated pipes. And we have blowers at the end of each of those pipes that force air up through these piles. And they're about. Well, they're probably about 8 to 10 feet wide, and they're about oh, 8 to 9 feet tall, actually, and they're kind of peaked. Um, and then we monitor temperature very closely in those piles. We have to have um, a certain temperature maintained for at least seven days. 
it's 130 degrees in order to make sure that we're killing the pathogens in there. These piles cook at much hotter temperatures than that, um, probably around 160 to 170 degrees for weeks on end. So you never see snow on these piles out here at the site. They are just cooking happily, and we're not turning them. Um, we lay a, a blanket of composted leaves over the top, and that does help retain the heat and, and um, sort of um, you know, it helps actually, it serves as a biofilter as well, because there are some odors that can be generated. But as long as this is well aerated, we don't have a lot of odor generation. We're very conscious of that. After about four months' time, we will screen the material. We use this big screener here, and it, uh, the big stuff comes out the back. Sometimes we'll get forks and, you know, plastic and whatnot in there, and, and out of the side then comes the good stuff. And it's not ready yet. Um, it needs to go through a curing phase here. So this is a much finer material. Um, it's still composting. You would still see temperatures probably around 120 degrees or so. And this material is turned then, um, cured more, until we reach the point where we can send it out for testing. So as I said, it, it can take as much as four to six months to make a batch of compost. And several of these windrows would constitute a batch of compost. And then we'll bag it, or we will um, uh, sell it in bulk. And that's on the public side over here. So if you've ever been to the yard waste site, um, you've seen the finished compost. This is what food waste looks like when it comes in in the middle of summer in one of the big trucks that's picked up some grocery stores. And so it's really quite a lot to handle. Um, this is probably one of the biggest loads we've ever had. It was about 55, you know, 60,000 tons of, of goodness. <laughs> and then here's some of that waste grain that we get from the elevator. And we use this. We'll mix it in every day, and it actually can help us corral. This stuff is quite liquidy corral this material, and then we'll come in quickly, and we'll drop loads of leaves on here um, just to sort of soft things up, and then he'll start to scoop this up and, and lay it out so that we can mix it for that, that day's mixture. Some of the challenges that we have, um, this is actually probably a load from the deck, it looks like, um, where if you've got a hockey game where you've got a lot of popcorn, a lot of paper waste, there isn't a huge amount of food waste in here, but everything that's here is compostable. So we have to be very careful when we're mixing this material. We don't want to be generating uh, litter or anything like that. So it's, there are some challenges when you're using a lot of the lightweight compostable plates and cups and things like that. Um, we also had issues with some bags that were marketed as compostable. In fact, they're not. Um, the state of Minnesota now has a rule that bans the sale of any of these kinds of uh, bags. Um, they have a material which allows them to break down very quickly, but what happens is that they break into tiny pieces of plastic. They don't really truly degrade. So um, we're glad to have that rule in place, and we do work with folks that want to use compostable goods to make sure that they are getting their hands on the right kind of stuff. Here's some of the more interesting uh, feedstock, as they call it. Um, the food waste that comes in, I think this might be below from one of our commercial fishermen. It's a frozen, uh, they empty out their garbage cans of, of um, their fish waste here. And it's a fabulous source of nitrogen for the composting process. So um, I had one guy call this the, the, the food waste that looks you in the eye, because if you look really closely, you can see that there's quite a few fish heads in here. Um, some of the folks that are not required to participate, but that do participate in this program, uh, where they're recovering compostable goods, they're actually utilizing plates, cups, uh, utensils, and then capturing the food waste that's generated from their events um, include the brew fest. We've had this now for two years down at um, Bayfront Park. The Harvest Festival, which is um, Sustainable Farming Association. Empty Bowl has been waste-free for many years down at uh, the depot. The Lions Pancake Breakfast, of course, is held at the deck, and they capture everything from that, and they serve thousands and thousands of people um, at that particular event. So it's really possible, and we have weddings, we've got all sorts of celebrations, other kinds of, of um, you know, community events, churches that, um, you know, when they're making their pasties or they're having their roast beef dinners, they capture all of the, the plate waste from that and their prep waste, and um, it's just a really great program. Uh, the places that are not required because they're not within, um, they don't fall under the ordinance or they're not within our district include some local coffee shops, University of, Superior, um, University of Wisconsin Superior, uh, the elementary schools I mentioned. There are several of these that have um, come on board and are capturing the food waste um, in their cafeterias. 
um, charitable captains, um, as I mentioned, the grain elevators, and even daycare establishments where you have a lot of food waste. <laughs> if you're making fresh fruit for the kids, you've got a lot of you know peels and pits and, and um, cores and things like that, or discarded waste that they don't like. It's really wonderful to be able to capture that. And these people would typically just use one of our drop sites to, to drop their food waste off at. Um, and then just kind of a rehashing of why would you even want to do this. Um, one thing we like to remind folks is, yep, if you send it off to the landfill, it might degrade. Um, but because our landfills are anaerobic, um, the degra degradation results in the generation of methane, which is um, even more potent greenhouse gas than, than carbon dioxide. You know, we have uh, nitrogen and phosphorus and other micronutrients that are tied up in our food waste. And it's such a waste to bury those things in the landfill when you actually can, can recover those and use those to grow food. Um, I think that virtually all of the, the folks that are generating a significant amount of food waste will tell you that just looking at what they're generating and what it costs to literally throw that away um, has made them save money and they really have improved their operations a lot. And so this has been, it's been a great partnership, I think, all around. Um, and again, you know, those nutrients, um, we have to, by law, compost yard waste. Um, in the state of Minnesota, you're not allowed to put land, uh, yard waste in the landfill, but it's, a, it's very heavy on, the, heavy on the carbon side. When you have food waste that you can add to it that provides a nice supply of nitrogen, it makes composting work so much better. Um, and last of all, um, you know, we have our hierarchy where if you can feed people or if you can send your food to an animal feeding operation or compost it, it's a much, much better um, solution than just sending the stuff to the landfill and sticking it away for forever. Um, yeah, so if this has piqued your interest, we do have a video that's posted on our website. It's called Harvesting the Leftovers, Turning Food Waste into Compost, WLSSD. You can just link into that and watch it. Um, we actually provide these as well. We'll send them out if you want to um, test the waters and play it for your employees and see what they think. Um, uh, also, you definitely need to contact your garbage hauler. Um, this is a service that you have to contract for. And we would certainly help you figure out just how frequently you would need to have collection and, and what even what your food waste is going to look like. So just trying to work that program into your facility and, and trying to determine if it is something that could possibly work, I think we would, we would recommend that you give us a call just to see um, you know, what the possibilities are. And I've included my email um, address as well here, so feel free to contact us. And that's it. Um, okay, Susie, I did have a question for you. I saw that you had um, UW Superior listed as one of the places that that does the food waste. Um, how would that yeah. work for businesses outside of your service area? Would they have to do anything special? So people in Superior, maybe. Right. So they would need to contact a hauler that um, services the area over there. And I think um, I'm actually not sure who hauls. I think it's waste management that hauls for. For superior, so someone that would be willing to come over, um, you know, and pick up the food waste, and if they're already over there doing that, I know I think Boathouse participated um, when they were still in operation, um, and my guess is that um, there are grocery stores that really, that are also doing it. Walmart, I think, um, is they are actually they're they've gone corporate with that, and so um, I think that you know Hartels. Uh, DBJ, Nordic Waste, and Waste Management are all um, haulers, private haulers that pick up food waste um, in this area. And so any of those folks would be, um, you know, people that, that you could call and ask, but what would it cost <laughs> and how often can I get it? And, and um, that's a really good place to start, I think. Okay. Would they need to pay anything to WLSSD or anything like that? Yeah, or okay. You know, no, because really, you know, we have charged fees from outside the service area for really large quantities of stuff. But we know that we're getting this in here. No, there is. That's the charm of um, the zero tip fee, which we have over here. When that material is properly separated and comes in here as clean food waste, <laughs> kind of a misnomer, but that's that is what it is. Without plastics, without you know, cans or bottles or anything in there. If that comes to our tip pad, there is no charge for that. So the only 
fee that you would be paying would be to the hauler to um, you know provide your bins and pick you up on a on a regular basis. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to transfer it back over to me just to show you my last my slide with the um, with the information about the next webinar. So thank you so much, Susie, for presenting the webinar. That was a ton of great information. Um, we'll have that up on our website, www.ci.superior.wi.us slash business. Um, you'll be able to watch that archived. We'll also have it on our blog and our YouTube page. Um, so again, this was from the Businesses Preventing Pollution webinar series. Our next webinar is November 13th, and we'll be talking about universal waste rules for mercury, and that's at 9.30 a.m. Um, so, so that's our next business webinar, but we also have a webinar coming up on November 12th, actually, the day before, about the wastewater treatment plant process over here in Superior. So if you're interested in tuning in to that, that will be at noon on November 12th. So thank you for participating and we'll end the webinar now.